budget gaming PC in 2022? Are you having a laugh? Is he having a laugh? Is he having a laugh? Well, apparently not, because NVIDIA have just released this, the RTX 3050. Apparently the answer to all of our prayers and affordable graphics card that's actually got enough VRAM. <coughs> AMD to actually play all of the latest and greatest AAA titles at moderate to high settings at an affordable price. The only issue is the same one we've been having for the last two years, that this might not be very affordable availability or actually sold at the price that it says. But other than those things, we're set for the budget gaming PC 2022. Let's start the build and put this through its paces after a short word from this video sponsor. DDR5 memory is here and Corsair has you covered. Extra bandwidth, sky high speeds and slick new designs make Corsair DDR5 Shine, with new Intel XMP 3.0 profiles that allow for crazy high overclocks with just a single click. Choose Vengeance for stylish performance without breaking the bank, or go all out with Dominator Platinum for insane speeds, stability, and jaw-dropping RGB effects. Learn more today with that link down below. Let's get ready to PC Gaming Rumble! As always, we're gonna kick off this build with the motherboard, and interestingly enough, we are actually going with the previous generation today. This board is the B560 Steel Legend from ASRock, and the thing that's great about it is that it has pretty much all the features that you're going to need. It supports processors up to i9 in capability, so you can get up to 10 cores potentially in this. It supports PCI Generation 4 for both an SSD and a graphics card. We've got overclocking support for the RAM, so we can enable XMP. In terms of I.O., it's not the most feature-rich, but we do have USB Type-C, plenty of USB 3.0, and then I'm always very appreciative of the six fan ports that you get for plenty of case expansion, in addition to three separate M.2 slots for SSDs. The only thing that I'm not quite so keen on with this board is that it doesn't actually come with Wi-Fi. So if you're the sort of gamer that is going to be playing wirelessly, you're going to want to spend a little bit more money and actually grab something that has it baked in. So we'll grab the motherboard and place it on top of the box. And then we can grab our CPU. And this is definitely where things get a little bit interesting. You might be wondering why I'm recommending grabbing an older generation over the newer, more current i5-12400F. So the next generation. And the simple answer is pretty much all about money. This is going to save you around about 30 to 40 pounds at the moment in the UK. And bearing in mind you're going to then need a B660 motherboard, which is a little bit more current, has a few more features I suppose, but that as well is going to be about 30, 40 pounds more. And the honest truth is that 80 pound combined isn't actually necessarily going to give you any better gaming performance in the titles that you're going to play. Ultimately, if you are building a proper budget gaming PC and you're looking to save every penny, this is a great way of doing it. Don't worry though, we do have some B550 motherboards in and we will be building some systems and properly looking at the different gaming performance. So get subscribed if you're not already so you don't miss that. But here's your i5 6 core chip and we're just going to open up this little bracket on the motherboard. It's called the retention arm. And then we're just going to gently lower this into place so that the gold arrow lines up with the one that's on the motherboard. And then secure it down in the opposite way. You did a second ago, and then this will pop off. As always, save this for later on. Our budget system needs some budget RAM, and this is some stuff I picked up myself. This is from Crucial, it's their Ballistics non-RGB. It's a set of two 8 gigabyte sticks for a total of 16. This stuff really does represent some brilliant value for money, as while it's not the absolute fastest kit out there, as it only runs at 3200 megahertz, in the games, again, that you're gonna play, you're probably not really gonna see any difference, and chances are, this is gonna be a lot cheaper. But it is always worth shopping around. There are deals out there, just waiting to be found. So grab hold of your BDE, your big deal energy, then open up slots two and four on your motherboard, line up the slots with the gap that's in the RAM, and give it a push till it clicks, and then repeat with the other one. If you're unsure whether it's in properly, just give it a firm press until these notches are definitely all nice and lined up. Then you can grab your screwdriver for the first time today. So unscrew the two screws holding this M.2 shield in place, and then you'll be left with this little M.2 slot at the top. Make sure you're using this one as this is connected directly to the CPU lanes rather than using the chipset, which in English basically means that you get a little bit more bandwidth if you're using this top slot. However, as we're not using a PCI Generation 4 SSD, I would reckon the performance is probably gonna be the same, but it's still good practice to use that one anyway. Then you can grab your solid state drive or your SSD. And at the time of purchase, this was pretty much the cheapest, best performing one for the money that I could find. This is the Western Digital WD Blue SN550. And this definitely isn't gonna win any awards for the fastest drive out there. It's not gonna have the largest cache out there, read write speeds. However, this is ridiculously affordable. There is plenty of storage on this really for a starter gaming PC. Yes, 500 gig isn't crazy, but ultimately this is a great way to get into the world of NVMe storage without spending an arm and a leg. You just grab your SSD, you line it up with the slot, 
push it back down, pick up your protective cover, making sure to have actually removed the protective film on the back, and then try not to damage your motherboard. You just lower it down, lining up with those screws again, then just fix it back down. It really is very simple. With that out of the way, it's time to get controversial once more and talk about the cooler. Yes, we're going for the stock cooler. <gasps> PC centric. You disappoint me. And I know, I know, I absolutely hate this as much as aftermarket CPU cooler companies do. Because realistically, yes, this is pretty naff. I mean, look at it. There is no mass to this whatsoever, but fundamentally it will do the job. And because this is free and it comes in the box, it's so easy to upgrade this in the future. Don't spend money replacing this now if you don't have that money and you've got to take it away from other components. I mean, a decent CPU cooler is only about 25, 30 pounds. So it's not exactly expensive, but it is very easy to upgrade next month when you get your next paycheck, which is what the smart people would do or the wealthy. But then why are you building a budget gaming PC, huh? What are you trying to hide? If you buy this CPU new, then you have some thermal paste pre-applied to this cooler and you can quite literally just clamp this down now. However, because I've used this before, I'll show you what you have to do if you get it used. It's very simple, you just grab some thermal paste, you put a small dollop on top of the CPU, then you can pick up your cooler, that I would recommend replacing as soon as you can. I'm really selling this product, aren't I? And then you just twist these pins to secure it down. Boom! Then you can grab this little cable that's dangling down, and you plug it in right here at the top where it says CPU fan. And then now we can move on to the case. It's a special case, like me. I should put that on my Tinder bio. Special case, needs help, please send date. So here is our case or our chassis. And I've gone for something a little bit different here because this is not necessarily an airflow orientated case. As you can see, we do have a solid panel on the front. There isn't actually any ventilation in this. It's just some cool lighting. But having said that, there are some pretty big vents along this side and this side. So it's already better than some NZXT cases. But ultimately the reason we've gone for this, which is the MSI Vampiric 010, is because it looks pretty cool and ultimately it is very cheap. I think I got this for around about 40 pounds or so. And the thing that I absolutely love about MSI cases is just that they know how to make a budget chassis right. If you spend 40 pounds with some other manufacturers, usually the sort of more cheaper, less known ones, then you get some to be honest with you, pieces of crap. Don't get me wrong, this is definitely not gonna be the best built case you've ever seen, but fundamentally for a cheaper chassis, it is very solid, it is very well put together. You do have ventilation on the top as well. While you don't have any dedicated cable management grommets, you do actually have plenty of sections that just naturally hide the cables. You've got room for a load of SSDs, a couple of hard drives, and then MSI do the thing I really like on budget cases, which is rather than give you a load of really cheap fans, they give you one semi-decent one. So this is actually RGB, you can expand this and put extra at a later date if you like them and if you don't it's just one fan that's going to waste. I think the only thing really that I'll say about airflow is that for this system it's going to be absolutely fine you're not going to have to worry about anything being suffocated maybe just add an extra fan at a later date but if you really are dead set on upgrading this over the years and you're eventually going to grab an i9 and put this in there maybe an RTX 3070 then this is when having that solid front panel is going to cause a little bit of an issue but the good news is that you can get a mesh version of this case or one that's very similar for about 10 pounds more. So not masses. Oh, we don't mention mass. Mass, Michael Massey, Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then watch Drive to Survive this year. Step one is to actually add the rest of the standoffs to this case so the motherboard can actually sit upon it. You get these three extra like gold things in the box and this is what you just wanna gently screw into place. It is a little bit annoying that they don't give you the tool to get them in tight though. If you're a professional like me though, you have the right bit on hand at all times. It is by no means essential, but you do get a cool noise, quite a manly noise, compensating. The next step is to grab the IO shield that comes in the box and then gently insert this at the back where you see this absolutely ginormous hole sticking out. This is where you're gonna plug in your USB ports. Then you can grab your case and lay it down nice and flat and then gently just lay this down so it lines up with the holes and then you can just screw this and secure it into place. And can we also appreciate how we've actually got my proper smaller screwdriver today? I won't get laughed at for once, even though it's the best thing ever. Only thing that is a little bit annoying is that we don't have one standoff screw for this port here. It's not gonna make any difference, it's just visual. But why didn't MSI give you enough in the bag? 
There's two more things left to add to this system, but before we get there, we probably should actually start to plug in some of these cables. This is where you have your power switch, your reset, and your HD LED LEDs. Then this big blue one is for your USB 3.0. And then you've got two that are very similar. One is for USB 2, and then the other is for HD audio. And essentially what all of this does is it makes your case front panel connections actually do anything. You're hooking this up to your motherboard. Oh, and you've also got a SATA connection to get the USB to work, but that'll be to the power supply. So we're gonna route the front panel connections through here at the bottom, and then you wanna feed it through so it's very close to where the front panel connections actually connect in the first place. It's then just a case of repeating the process with the rest of the cables. USB 3 is over here. USB 2.0 is actually pretty close to the power switch. I'm not a fan of that ketchup and mustard though, that's pretty nasty, isn't it? And then finally, HD audio is always on the left of the motherboard. I believe that's all of the cables plugged in, so now's the time to add some more. Some power cables. The hardcore cables. The ones that could potentially blow up your system if you buy a really cheap thing. Don't spend 20 pounds on a power supply, please. And not $20 either, wise guy. The one that we've got here is from EVGA. This is their 600 watt non-modular 80 plus very unremarkable power supply. I don't think that's the official name. But this comes in at around about 40 to 45 pounds. It's 600 watts, so if you do want to upgrade this in the future to something like a 3060 Ti, this is a great option. Just make sure that the fan is facing downwards so it can actually breathe. Then just line it up with the holes at the back. You can then find the hex screws that came with your case or your power supply. Get that safe and secure. Then you have a load of dangly cables that need to be rehomed. It's like a lost dog at the shelter. Feel sorry for them. Adopt them, bring them into your life. The thing that's pretty good about these EVGA ones actually is that they are all black. So unlike that horrible USB that we saw earlier, these aren't gonna look disgusting. We'll look for these long thin ones first actually because this is for that SATA connection that I told you about earlier to actually get the case lighting to work and then sort of tidy it up stowing it away somewhere really. That is the downside of a non-modular power supply. You have to use all of the cables regardless of whether you're actually going to use them in your system. This is your CPU connections. These need to go right here at the top. I actually forgot we've got a fan to plug in as well. Just below them we've got these cables that say VGA on them. These are for your graphics card. But obviously we haven't actually inserted that yet. So for now we can grab this massive ATX power connection and then you just feed it in the absolutely ginormous hole here. And then you've got your CPU power connections up here at the top. If you're following along at home, then you've probably noticed you've also got some fan cables. This is a four pin PWM fan connector. This is what actually controls the fan speed. And then you also have this other one, which is an addressable RGB pin, which controls the RGB. It's a little bit tight, but you can actually pull these cables through to the bottom. And then this is where you've got your addressable RGB. And then your other fan header. Bang. While I definitely don't like those cables, look how neat this is at the back already. It's really helpful because MSI give you these little bars to the side so you can get all of those cables neat. And then I'd say just one cable tie really to secure that over there. And you're pretty much done. But let's not talk about the most exciting bit before we talk about the boring bit, the brand new RTX 3050. I know, cable management is the one. But of course, all jokes aside, the 3050 is a really exciting card because it is the entryway to PC gaming for most people, really. And obviously, it is such a shame that this launch is marred by stock availability issues and companies just charging way too much money for something that really should be the MSRP. But alas, these are just the times that we're living in at the moment. There's not much we can do other than try to get one for a price that is as reasonable as possible. The one that we've got here is from Palette, and I like these cards because they are actually going to be the closest to MSRP, really. It's definitely not going to be the most out there graphics card in the world. You can see it is very small. It's not gonna be as quiet as some that use two fans, but it's all about price to performance, this thing. And I think it's pretty crazy that you do actually get some ray tracing cores, tensor cores for DLSS, and actually eight gigabytes of VRAM. Don't get me wrong, the base graphics card is still around about 250 pounds if you can get it at RRP, which is a lot more expensive than this would have cost like three or four years ago. But I am really excited to actually test this to see what sort of performance you can get from the baseline RTX experience. And I also need to get new glasses because these keep falling down look and it's really starting to annoy me. I've heard rumors that you can like get a hairdryer and sort of bend the ends in. Like serious question, how do you fix glasses? Let me know down below. Should we get back to the build? Or just focus on four eyes over here for the next half hour? No, don't answer that. Oh, that is a very weird design. Because I have a feeling when I remove this screw, all of the PCI slots are gonna fall out. Oh no, no it's fine. Ah, I see. This is a motherboard where you've got to bend them out which is pretty annoying because you can damage your motherboard. I have done that before. 
There, look. I've learnt my lesson. Oh, my bin's over there now. Oh, he scored though! Unbelievable, Techers! Can I get this other one in, actually? Oh my god, through the ring light. Yes, boys! Get in! Proof, proof, look, there's two in there, there's two in there. We need to calm down, we need to calm down. There's too much excitement in this room. It's the PC, it's giving off vibes. We grab the graphics card, we will line it up with the slot and we will push it home. Get it nice and secure. Pull this cable through, route it to the graphics card, and then just plug it in. As promised, it was just a single cable tie around the back, and you can see that is incredibly clean. And then around the front, while it's definitely not the most uh, out there system in the world, we're missing a few fans. It does look a bit more like a budget gaming PC. I think this is a system you're gonna be really proud of. But we need to see if this thing works, and ultimately whether it plays any games. Worst gaming PC ever if it plays nothing, other than RuneScape. Though I'd be happy with that. No, Michael, no, no. This is not right. Toto, it's called a motor race. We will grab ourselves a 1080p high refresh rate monitor as this is gonna be the perfect pairing. I would say it's probably fair to expect around about like Xbox Series S sort of performance, but I haven't wanted to ruin the surprise and look at all of the Nvidia paperwork. So I'm pretty keen to see how it will perform. Let's plug our HDMI into the graphics card and give it some power. Classic. Ah, we have lighting. Whoa, okay. Here we go then. Here we go. Will we see success? Yes, that's what we're talking about. We can enable the XMP, set the CPU fan to silent, enable above 4G decoding and clever access memory. Then we will grab our copy of Windows 11 from the Windows website. I haven't actually seen the front of this case yet. Let's have a look. Let's have a look along with you. I mean, it's very simple, actually. I was thinking it was going to be a little bit orange. It's definitely not the absolute best looking system I've ever put together, but I think for the money, you would be very happy with that. And think of the expandability. There's so much you could do with this. I'm going to be very interested to see whether this actually works, though, because Windows 11 only works on motherboards that have TPM turned on by default, which is basically secure boot. So how user-friendly is this motherboard? Will it let me do it out of the box? Copying files, done. Oi, oi, while we're waiting, We've got some, uh, we've got some chats going on over here. Look, look at that. Bang. That is probably not going to amass to anything. I'll keep you updated. I mean, who wouldn't want to date this? <coughs> Sexy. Well, it certainly seems like it works anyway. I'm going to plug in this ethernet connection, make sure everything is set up properly, get some games installed, and I'll see you in three. And by three, I mean tomorrow, because I'm tired. And ladies and gentlemen, we are back. I have changed jumper. It's a new day. Things are looking bright. And we're gonna kick off our gaming performance with some brand new God of War. Well, I say brand new, it's been out on PlayStation for years, but for PC, it's brand new. I absolutely loved this game the first time I played it. The story is phenomenal, the acting is immense, and the gameplay is really satisfying. It was actually Nvidia that provided us with the code for this, because this runs not only DLSS technology, so you can render it at a slightly lower resolution before using clever upscaling technology to actually get it as close to the original as possible, but with the end result being a much higher frame rate. Here we're running at 1080p original settings, but with DLSS enabled, and as you can see, we're getting anywhere really between 80 and 110 frames per second. Definitely a lot better than the 30 that you would have got on the PS4. But what if you're not into your single player games? What if you're buying this to play with some friends? Then you're probably gonna wanna play some Halo Infinite. I've been playing it a lot and I'm still bad at it. I think we'll set this to the high preset, but then whack up the textures to ultra, which you can see do actually fit in this card. <laughs> AMD. While it's connecting to the multiplayer game though, I really do have to say just how loud this system is. And it's not the graphics card, oh no. It is that stock CPU cooler. I know I said to you to use it for the time being, and I do agree that is the right move. However, please replace it as soon as you can. It is so loud, and your PC really doesn't need to be. Your music's bad and you should feel bad. Okay, here we go then. 71 frames a second straight out of the bat in multiplayer. It does feel nice and smooth though. I would appreciate a little bit more frame rate, but I am spoiled. I'm used to playing this at 120. This is a lot better than the 60 you're gonna get on consoles. Assuming you're not playing on a Series X, of course. Got one, hooray. Got two. Oh, got three. Let's move on to my favorite. The game I haven't played in months because I got burnout. Some Apex Legends. Woo. 
Let's go into the settings and we'll set everything to be max and of course VSync disabled. Insane textures, eight gig of VRAM. I think you're getting the picture. Jumping out of the jet around about 80, 90, 96 FPS. Obviously this is only 1080p, but realistically if you are looking at a budget system, this is gonna be the target for you really. And besides, it's gonna save you money on a monitor like this and it is gonna enable high frame rates. I think it's time to move on to some Battlefield 2042. I don't think it's been the most popular game. Let's increase the field of view to 80, 55 is way too low. Graphics quality was set to high, please. DLSS to quality. I guess we could try ray tracing, cause this is a ray tracing card, but I think this is gonna kill it. But let's see. And actually I am surprised, bearing in mind we do have some ray tracing enabled here, we are getting around about 60 FPS. Okay, it is dropping a little bit to around about 49, but this is very, very playable. Disable the ray tracing. And we've jumped up to around about 70 to 80 frames a second. So it's not exactly night and day, but it definitely feels a whole lot smoother. And to be honest with you, when you're running around, it's not gonna make that much difference to the visuals either. It's definitely a nice thing to have. It's nice that you can play around with it. And definitely in certain games, you are gonna wanna turn ray tracing on, but realistically a 3050 is not gonna be the ray tracing card of your dreams. Oh, this isn't doing anything, is it? And that's probably a good place to end this video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts on this PC, actually. I think it's such a great starter platform. There are so many things you could do with this. And as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything featured in this rig, you can find it linked down below with my Amazon affiliate links. And while you're down there, grab your DDR5 with Corsair. Vengeance DDR5 has a slick new compact look and it's been designed to get the very best out of Intel's Alder Lake CPUs. Dominator Platinum DDR5, meanwhile, takes it to an entirely new level with its gorgeous heat spreader finish and vivid RGB lighting that's all powered by Corsair IQ. Level up your memory today with that link down below. Smash the like button, get yourself subscribed, and I'll see you in the next one.